Welcome back to Bluegrass. It's a beautiful May afternoon. I'm out with Annie and a box full of retrieving items. And we're going to work on pick that up and hand it to me. <laughs> so a lot of people ask me questions about retrieving. And like, look, retrieving is really like if you, if, you, if you strip it down to the most essential things, like the only thing retrieving is is pick that up and hand it to me, right? And uh, whether or not you're going to be successful with retrieving uh, kind of boils down to how you set your expectations and what type of dog you have, okay? Um, what I'm fixing to show you, it works really well and super fun to do with dogs that like to retrieve. And so like you can have pretty high standards and use this technique and get a dog that ends up doing really well in terms of uh, re retrieving reliably and coming back to the service heel position, delivering to ham. Uh, but for dogs that uh, aren't really strong natural retrievers, what you're going to do doing this technique uh, is you might teach them how to pick stuff up and hand it to you. And you might get some retrieving in your kitchen or your yard, okay? But uh, it's always going to fall apart uh, when you go out to high distraction environments. And guys, that doesn't mean you have to be unhappy. Okay? It just means that you need to learn to set realistic expectations. If you want a dog that really loves to fetch, you know, buy a dog that looks like that. Right? Okay? If you want a dog uh, to fetch because you just want to see whether or not you can encourage the dog to pick things up and hand them to you, uh, then any dog can learn to fetch. Okay? It, it's all about how you choose to define success. Okay? So like for me, you know, I like to, I, you know, these dogs, uh, like Annie, her job, uh, like No Name's job ultimately, is just to be a mentor dog to the other dogs. So I need her to be able to play fetch good enough so when little kids come out here, uh, they can throw a ball and she'll go get it and take it back to them, you know? I mean, that's really all I need. Uh, I need her to be able to do the dummy launcher a little bit so I can show people that are interested in training their own hunting dogs. I mean, there's a few things I need, but I don't need a lot, okay? And so I can't come out on a Monday and hold her to a higher standard than I would on a Tuesday. Okay, so watch what I, watch for me personally. Watch, watch the kind of stuff I work on with, uh, how old is she, seven months old? The seven month old field bred retriever. Okay, so one of the, the big problems that I see is that like, you know, people will play fetch with certain items and uh, the dogs will kind of develop an affinity for that particular game. And then if people try to change items, then the dog doesn't necessarily have the same amount of drive or desire or perform with the same uh, precision, okay? You can alleviate that by starting early and just when, when you're doing your inductive retrieve, make sure that every day you get a few reps in with different types of retrieving items, different sizes, different shapes, different textures. Okay, so I went from a teeny tiny dummy to a little bit bigger dummy. And all I'm doing is I'm asking her to take this from my hand and uh, kind of wait patiently. Now, she's seven months old, so she's in uh, kind of the early onset uh, of adolescence. So you'll notice she's a little fidgety and maybe she mouths a little bit. Uh, for me personally, uh, those kinds of mistakes they make out of youthful exuberance, I don't correct that. I know they'll outgrow it over time, so I don't worry about it. Okay, We just keep plugging away. So now I'm going to go to a little bit larger dumbbell. And I'm going to wait. I like to put a count on it, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, whatever my count is. I appreciate it. If you give them a fat treat, make sure you give them time to eat, right? Now, um, I'm working my way up to a really heavy uh, dumbbell, okay? So a couple things are going to happen here. I'm going to hand it to her. I'm going to ask her to hold it. I'll probably ask her to hold it for a little bit less time. And then I'm going to kind of give her a little bit special high-value treat for holding this one. So that's pretty heavy. I'm going to reach in here and kind of dig through my treats till I can get to a really good one. Two, three, four, five. Very nice. Okay. So we kind of went up uh, in levels of difficulty from the teeny tiny dumbbell all the way up to the big heavy dumbbell. Okay. Now, there's never any telling what it is that your dog is going to have uh, problems uh, fetching, right? Okay. So you'll get all your stuff. You'll get on Gun Dog Supply and you'll order some new stuff and you'll go to throw in dummies for your dog and they don't like that dummy. Okay. <laughs> well, this right here, what we're doing helps alleviate. It doesn't fix it, but it helps it. Like this particular dummy, Annie doesn't like these kind of dummies for some reason. I don't know. So we've been working on getting her to hold that. Okay. And she's doing a little bit better, but she doesn't love it. The thing is, I have to do a lot of things in life that I don't love, and uh, so if she wants to be fully integrated into my life, uh, she has to kind of, uh, you know, learn to do some things that she doesn't love so much. One of the things that causes a lot of people trouble, like, should I play tug with my dog, and will tugging interfere with my retrieving? Well, it can. You know, now if you have kind of a low drive dog, and you throw stuff for them, and they bring it back, and you tug with them, and... Uh, 
you know, like, like, like you can build desire for the retrieve out of desire for the tug, uh, but a lot of times what ends up happening, especially if you're a little bit older, you just end up having a dog that tugs your arm out of socket and then you don't want to play fetch, so the dog doesn't get to play fetch and you don't get to, it's a mess, right? You can kind of get rid of that problem by taking your retrieving items and your tugging items, okay, throwing them in a box, bringing your retrieving items out sometimes and just asking the dog to hold the, uh, the tugging item out and, and asking the dog to hold the tugging item politely and then release it gently, okay? So the, even though that's a tugging item, I want her to hold it, uh, I want her to be calm, attentive, and polite, and then I want her to release it gently, okay? Now, most of the things that you've seen me have her hold so far have been kind of dumbbell shaped. I like using the dumbbell shaped things because it helps dogs learn to pick things up in the middle. When you start switching to dummies like this, what you'll notice is that they want to pick it up on the side or they want to pick it up by the rope. All right, so the real key here is just take this rope off when you're beginning, okay? Because if you don't, what's gonna happen is the dog's gonna end up picking this up and then they're gonna shake it around. Sometimes they'll shake it around and whack themselves in the head and then they won't want to pick it up anymore, okay? So when you first start doing your inductive retrieve, just take the rope off, right? And then after a while, your dog kind of get the hang of it, put them on a count, two, three, four, five, and everything goes uh, swimmingly, okay? Now, other things that, uh, you know, you might want to play fetch with that maybe I don't want to play with fetch with, it's like a tennis ball. Okay, fetch. Now, so with the tennis ball, a lot of times what happens is because it's kind of squishy, is the dogs will flex, flex, flex it. Okay, so I like to try to give them the tennis ball and uh, put a count on it and reward them for not flexing it. Three, four, five. Very nice. Uh, same thing goes for a Kong. A Kong is a, it's a, you know, everybody gets these Kongs and they think about stuffing the Kongs for the dogs to chew on. But what a Kong's really good for is throwing in a field because the Kong bounces very erratically, okay, and it keeps the dogs interested. And so throwing a Kong for a dog, you're gonna get a good 20 to maybe 50% more exercise per throw than you would with a tennis ball, okay? Uh, but again, the problem with the Kong, especially if you've used them with puppies, is they wanna flex it, flex it, flex it. And like, when you go to get the Kong out of their mouth, sometimes they'll flex it and they'll bite your finger. I just had that happen the other day. Uh, the problem with getting dog bites on your finger is that, uh, there's a lot of bacteria, so then your finger gets, that finger got in, <laughs> got infected, you know? All right, so I ask her to hold that, and you say, look, say, so she's looking at that, and she's going, Stoney, I really, I'm not into that one, you know? But I'm gonna ask her to do it anyway. Now look here, so this is kind of a refusal, okay? It, it, but don't take it personally, she's just saying, hey, Stoney, I really don't like, I don't like that one, okay? And so I'm gonna say, hey, I, you know, if you wanna continue playing with this game, you're gonna have to pick that up and hold it. And if she drops it off the table, she has to get down and get it, and she has to pick it up, and she has to hold it, and she has to wait politely without flexing, okay? Now, uh, the thing is here is there's things in the box that she does like. We're not going to progress to things that she does like until she does the things that she doesn't like. Uh, a good analogy for this is when you're a little kid, you know, and you've got some broccoli on your plate, and you know there's some dessert sitting on the stove, and your mom says, well, listen, you have to eat your broccoli if you want to get to the, you know, apple pie. So I'm going to ask her to hold it. Hey, fetch that up. <laughs> here, look here. You're going to have to eat your broccoli. Okay, so she's eating her broccoli. Two, three, four, five. Very nice. Okay. Now, other things that you'll, like, you know, that are popular, especially on, uh, on the internet, uh, that you might have problems with. You, you'll have a dog, and maybe they're really great at chasing and fetching a ball, or a dumbbell, or a dummy, and you say, well, I'm going to go ahead and transition over to shed hunting, because all shed hunting is, they're just going out and looking for a retrieving item, really, you know what I'm saying? Uh, hey, these are hard. Like, and so dogs don't mind like laying down and kind of gnawing on them, but most dogs don't really just love picking them up and, and uh, putting them in their mouth. Okay, so this takes some uh, special acclimation for some dogs. So I'll put it down here. Ask the dog to pick it up. Two, three, four, five. Now another thing, remember we were talking about with the dumbbells where you gotta learn to pick them up in the middle. Sheds have different balance points and you want your dog to learn to pick the shed up so it hangs naturally in their mouth and uh, that way it's not accidentally point, point, poking them. Because sometimes what'll happen is if they come back and it's a little pokey or off balance, they drop it and then when they go to re-engage with it, they poke themselves and then they don't wanna do it anymore, okay? So make sure if you're gonna do some Oh, make sure if you're going to do some shed hunting uh, that you take a little bit of time and you teach the dogs how to pick up and hold the sheds. Okay, trust me, this little exercise right here is going to save you a lot of trouble later on. Okay, because the worst thing that can happen is you get excited, dogs running around, they drop it, they go to re-engage and they poke themselves and then, uh, you know, they don't want to do it anymore.
remember guys, like, not every dog is going to overcome adversity as it relates to retrieving, okay? So just a couple of bad experiences for some dogs are going to make them not want to retrieve a, a particular kind of item at all. Uh, sometimes what will really get you, like, is weight or, like, distracting material on your dummies. So these kind of dummies, they look really cool, like, when you throw them, okay? Watch, watch, see how you can, like, see how that looks? You like the... the Kind of looks like wings. Hey, the dogs get really excited chasing these. It's really great for build and drive. But guess what they want to do on the way back? They want to hold it like this, or they want to hold it by the rope, or they want to stop and gnaw on the head. Okay, so again, you know, in between your, you know, your trips to your training field, uh, just sit around the house and practice having the dog pick up this kind of item uh, and deliver it to you. You know, uh, you know, calmly, attentively, and politely. And that's pretty heavy. Two, three, four, five. So I'll. Kind of drop my uh, timer. Okay, very nice. Okay, and then the last thing we get lots of questions about, uh, like frisbees. Okay, what should you do with the frisbee? Um, in, in my, in, in my honest opinion, guys, uh, the the fun of frisbee playing for most dogs isn't worth the potential price. Uh, for what happens if you mess up. Like today's very windy, and I've been throwing frisbees for dogs for a really long time, but even, you know, not that I'm an expert frisbee thrower, but I'm pretty good at it. Even me, when I go to throw the frisbee, what ends up happening a lot of times is the wind catches it and, and, and the frisbee will all of a sudden take a big direction change. If a dog is jumping up in the air and is trying to get the frisbee, right, okay, and the frisbee all of a sudden shifts, well, the dog shifts with it, and when they come down, they have a tendency to watch, like, instead of landing like this, they'll land like this, and they'll pinch their spine above their pelvis, kind of where the sacral lumbar area is. And I've seen a lot of dogs develop permanent limbs as a result of missing a frisbee catch. But if you do want to catch a frisbee, again, like, the, 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 the basic rules apply, you know, the same way. You want to make your dog understand the essence of the game is to... Is to, is to take this and hand it to you. So look, so here it is in the air. I'd like for the dog to take it, and then I'd like for the dog to hand it to me. Very nice, okay? So I'll move it down that way. So I'd like for the dog to pick that up and hand it to me. Okay, okay so, so we're gonna go over here, and we're gonna talk about uh, getting the dog to catch a Frisbee. Uh, now, in my opinion, again, like Frisbee playing, uh, I think it's a little too dangerous for the payoff, okay? But if you are gonna play Frisbee, then I think there's some things that you can do to, uh, you know, kinda, kinda make it a little bit safer for you and the dog and make it a little bit more enjoyable for the dog in terms of learning. All right, so first things first is that what I have to do is I have to keep the dog in the mindset of the games we're playing related to retrieving. It's just grab that and hand it to me or pick that up and hand it to me, right? Okay, but notice that there's a little bit of difference between grab it and hand it to me and pick it up and hand it to me. So <laughs> if, if I'm working on retrieving a lot with this dog, then what happens is she just watches it go fall down. She's going to go pick it up, and then she's going to return it to me, okay? Come on! Oh my gosh, what a good dog. So from her perspective, that's how the game works. So if I just come out here and I throw this frisbee, she's just going to watch it, you know? And then when it falls down, she's going to grab it and she's going to bring it back to me. Well, uh, you know, that's not what looks cool, right? What looks cool is when the dogs see the frisbee, they understand that you'd like for them to go get it while it's still in the air and then bring it back and hand it to you, okay? So you might end up wanting to play with a frisbee kind of like this size, but you'll notice when she went and got that frisbee the first time there, like she got it and it kind of folded up. And then she was like, oh, wow, this is fun. And she started shaking it, and then she kind of lost focus. And, you know, and that's what happens when you throw things far away is you, have, you don't have a lot of ability to influence the dogs, right? So we're going to start our Frisbee playing up close using the same principles that we use for uh, our other retrieving items. So I've got my little, I, I, it's taken, I start off with my small disc. I just get her in front of me. I tease her just a little bit, and then watch. I'm just going to try to spin this so it's like in the air, right? So... Oh my gosh, very nice. Come here, you're a good dog. And so, like, she didn't get it right then, but she was kind of close. She's starting to understand how this game works. So I'm going to spin it. Very nice. With retrieving, less is more, so always try to keep your repetition uh, schedule in the, like three to five reps per session. You can do a lot of sessions per day, but uh, high session count, low repetition count is the general rule. 
Very nice. Oh my gosh, a very good dog. Where'd you go? Where'd you go? Very nice. Oh, come here. Okay, there we go. And that's, you know, if I was gonna teach a dog to, to catch a frisbee, that's how I would start off. What I would not do is come out here and throw my frisbee really far and expect the dog to understand to run out there and run under it and uh, grab it like the border college that she's been watching on YouTube, right? It's not gonna happen. These labs really aren't, uh, they're kind of blocky dogs. They're not designed to be jumping up and catching and being super agile and acrobatic. So don't expect them to be. You can play frisbee with them, but it's gonna have to be kind of, uh, well, I'll get a dog, I'll get a lab and show you. Just hold, hold on just a second. Well, let No Name out. Now, No Name is not a Frisbee dog. He's just a Labrador Retriever that has a pretty high retrieving drive. Uh, he knows how to catch Frisbees, and uh, the only time I play Frisbee with them is if I have someone out and I'm using him as a mentor dog. I don't play Frisbee with my own dogs because I think that the risk versus reward uh, is not a good ratio, okay? But sometimes people are just, you know, they just really want to learn to play Frisbee with their dogs, and so uh, I teach people what they want to know, whether or not I particularly agree with it or not. I just try to teach people how to do things very safely. Uh, now, the first issue with safety is picking you a good spot. Um, ideally, you want uh, like a nice flat field, okay? But if you don't have a perfectly flat field, then play Frisbee on the decline, okay? So let me show you what I mean. We're going to walk down this hill, okay? Now, so if I throw a Frisbee, watch my hand, okay? So as I throw the Frisbee, you'll notice that the ground is getting farther away from my hand, at least till my hand starts to go down. So when you throw a Frisbee on the decline, you allow the dog more time to run underneath the Frisbee and make adjustments, and you decrease the likelihood of them getting themselves in an off-camber situation, a kind of off-balance situation, and coming down at an angle. So I'm gonna walk up. So here's a nice flat spot. Now I could play on the flat, okay? And if I have a really good athletic dog, I can play right on the flat, and they're gonna catch the Frisbee most, time, most times. If I have a dog, like No Name, who's got a lot of drive, but it's not necessarily the most athletic dog in the world. I want to I want to set him up for success by keeping the frisbee in the air as long as possible. You can wait right there, cameraman. So I'm going to come up the incline a little bit, and I'm going to throw the frisbee as level as I can. But even though the frisbee's level, which keeps it, uh, you know, from being quite so subject to the to the manipulation from the wind, okay there's going to be a lot of time for the dog to run under the frisbee right okay so here it is <clears throat> very nice and you see right there where like no name went to get it and he hit it with his nose and it bounced it that's the kind of stuff that i'm telling you happens with the frisbee throwing now since he was running on the decline he didn't have to jump and be crazy to try to access the frisbee all he had to do was keep running and I hope this is coming, coming through on the camera because I don't know if, if it is. But what I want to have happen is I want to maximize my dog's chances to be underneath the Frisbee without having to put themselves in a precarious position. Get up here. Very nice. So I'm going to spin the Frisbee. Very nice. And I know it looks really, really cool to throw the Frisbee like way up in the air so the dog has to jump up and adjust. And that's okay for some types of dogs, like some of the skinnier Malinois and the Border Collies and Australian Shepherds that uh, you know, are pretty wiry and don't carry a lot of weight, they're not very blocky, you know, they can really handle a lot of mid-air adjustments that the blockier high drive dogs can't. You know, German Shepherds often have a lot of drive for the activity, but they lack the ability to like uh, make adjustments with their big bodies, you know, and so this is a common way to hurt a German Shepherd. It's a common way to hurt a Labrador Retriever, okay? Chesapeake Bay Retriever is the same thing. Your bigger, blockier dogs, okay, they can play Frisbee, but it needs to be in a linear fashion, and it needs to be on the decline, so you maximize your dog's ability to make adjustments without having to, uh, to jump up in the air too far. No, no, come on. Oh, my gosh. All right, back up down there a little ways, cameraman. Now, so right there was a perfect example of what I was talking about. I don't know if the cameraman caught it or not, but I threw the Frisbee the exact same way I'd been throwing it, but a gust of wind came and the Frisbee slowed down and gained altitude. And luckily it was behind no name, so he didn't see it and, and jump up high to make that adjustment. Okay, look here. I'll try to throw it more at you, cameraman. Let me back up 
this way. <clears throat> now see right there, I'm buying no name time by throwing it on the decline. <laughs> Trying to keep his body pretty close to the ground. And I know that's not the most exciting looking Frisbee catch in the world, but it's fun for the dog and it's fun for me. So we're kind of meeting in the middle in terms of having a fun activity that's still safe. Now, if you don't want to take that kind of risk, you can get your dog in the habit of running out in front of you and you can literally just learn to play catch with them. So that way the dog gets to catch the frisbee, okay? But like there's almost zero danger to that. So you have options, okay? All of this stuff starts though with uh, the inductive retrieve. You know, it starts with, hey, pick that up and hand it to me. And then once you have pick that up and hand it to me, uh, you know, on lock, then you say, oh, sometimes you have to kind of grab stuff out of the, out of, out of, out of, out of the air and hand it to me, right? Okay, so um, just to kind of sum up what I've been talking about today, in between your trips to play actual retrieving games, right, just set around, get you a big box of items, and practice having your dog pick up and hand you things. And if you do that consistently, then what you're gonna notice is that your total training volume, the number of times per week that you get to influence your dog the way you'd like for, for it to be influenced, is gonna translate over there into those high distraction environments, and it's gonna improve your retrieving all the way around, and it's going to cut your fussing and, and carrying on down to almost zero. All right, guys, good luck, and I'll see you next week. Oh, you a good dog. Oh, my gosh. You a good dog. Very nice. Such a smart boy. You such a smart boy. Such a smart boy. Very nice. You a good boy. You a good dog.